Yeah, Patrice, can I help you? Patrice, it's Dave Cam. Let me talk to Postman right now. Okay, he's on another line. Right now, let me talk to Postman. Hold on. Dave? Get everybody out here to my house now. Okay, all right. My wife and my kids are dead. Get everybody out here to my house. Go to Dave Cam's house now. Think we're ahead. Okay, David, we're getting, we got people on the way, okay? Get everybody out here. Come here. We're, everything's going to be okay, all right? We're going to get Remember, people Everything's out. not okay. Get everybody out here people. now. They're coming. Go to Dave Cam's house now. Okay. Oh you know what happened, David? No. They're dead. I just got over the plane back. 45, 48, Ellisburg. Oh, my God. What am I going to do? Uh, Andrew, get David, everybody out David, they're on their way right now, okay? The phone call you just heard was made by 36-year-old David Cam of Georgetown, Indiana, shortly after 9.30pm on September 28, 2000. The former Indiana State Police Trooper, who had left the force just four months prior, had returned home from playing basketball with friends at a nearby church to find his wife and two children shot to death in the garage. When the police arrived, they found David's wife, 35-year-old Kimberly Cam, lying motionless on the floor of the garage. In the family Bronco, officers discovered 7-year-old Bradley and 5-year-old Jill. As with their mother, both kids had been shot dead. David and Kimberly had both grown up in the city of New Albany and married in the spring of 1989 after five years of dating. That same year, David was accepted into the Indiana State Police, while Kim worked as an accountant. In 1992, David found himself at the centre of one of the biggest crime stories of the century. A 12-year-old girl by the name of Shanda Shearer had been reported missing by her father, and her body was subsequently found on the side of a lonely stretch of road near a hunting ground. David Cam was one of the first responding officers to the scene and was placed in charge of collecting forensic evidence. It later emerged that the young girl had been brutally tortured and burned alive by several of her friends. In 1993, Kim gave birth to the couple's first child, a boy whom they named Bradley. From the outside, it appeared as if the marriage was perfect, but while Kim was pregnant with their second child, David had an affair with a woman he had met in a gym. For a while, David moved out of the family home, but he and Kim would eventually reconcile and they would welcome baby Jill in 1995. David continued working for the Indiana State Police for the next few years, but in the summer of 2000, he left to go work for his uncle's basement waterproofing business. His new career choice might have been a little less exciting than law enforcement, but it still paid better and allowed David to spend more time with his kids. Patrice, it's Dave Cam. Let me talk to Postman right now. Okay, he's on another line. Right now, let me talk to Postman. Hold on. Dave? Get everybody out here to my house now. Okay, all right. My wife and my kids are dead. After hearing his desperate call for help, David's former colleagues rushed to his home. One of the first officers to arrive was Detective Sean Clements. He and David had been, and still were, close friends. David told Clements that after finding his family dead, he thought there was a chance that his son Bradley might still be alive. David said that he entered the Bronco via the front passenger door, grabbed his son from the back seat and placed him on the floor of the garage. David claimed that he attempted CPR on Bradley, but to no avail. Right from the get-go, Clements wasn't buying that. He had been to homicide scenes before, where witnesses had come into contact with the victim and tried to render aid. Normally, the witness would leave bloody footprints at the scene, but Clements didn't see any on the garage floor at all. Officers also observed Kim's shoes lying neatly on the roof of the Bronco. They seemed oddly out of place, almost too neat, as if her killer had very carefully placed them there. Detectives requested Rodney Englert a blood spotter expert to attend the scene. However, he wasn't available, so he sent his photographer in his stead. Robert states would tell detectives that eight small stains of blood 
on David's t-shirt were consistent with what is known as high velocity impact splatter. In other words, the blood was moving at a high speed when it came into contact with the fabric of the t-shirt. Despite the fact that investigators were on good terms with David Cam, the evidence suggesting his involvement in the killings was starting to mount. David claimed to have been playing basketball at a local church rec centre between 7pm and approximately 9.30pm, but a phone bill suggested that he had made a call from the family home at 7.19pm on the night of the murders, blowing a gaping hole in his supposedly airtight alibi. Detectives were also confused as to why David had called his former police post to report the murders. Why hadn't he just called 911? Did he want his former friends and colleagues to be the first responders because he thought they would never possibly consider him a suspect? If that was the case, then he was seriously mistaken. Three days after the murders, David was called in to speak with detectives. Despite his pleas of innocence, David was charged with murdering his wife, seven-year-old son and five-year-old daughter. Despite no fewer than 11 people claiming that David was playing basketball with them at the time of the murders, detectives argued that at some point he had nipped out to shoot his family dead before returning to the church. The distance between the rec centre and David's home was less than a five minute drive and prosecutors were adamant that David could have driven home, killed his family and returned to the basketball game in approximately 15 minutes. In January 2002, David's trial began. Prosecutors were under no obligation to provide a motive for the killings, but they still called over a dozen women who had had flings with David over the years, or who had been propositioned by him. David had already admitted to having had an affair back in the 1990s, and it was obvious that the prosecution was trying to paint him as an adulterous husband, a serial cheater who didn't give a damn about his wife. An autopsy report showed that the murders had taken place at some time between 7.30 and 8pm. Prosecutors argued that the phone call David had supposedly made from the family home at 7.19pm was consistent with this timeline. There was just one problem with that theory though. The phone call had actually taken place at 6 19 p.m. It turned out that the call that David had made was to somebody in a time zone one hour ahead. David's basketball buddies also testified that at no point did he leave the church rec centre while they were there also. None of them recalled seeing him with blood on his t-shirt. Despite the best efforts of the defence though, David Cam was found guilty of murdering his family on March 17th 2002. He was sentenced to 195 years behind bars. The story of David Cam could have ended there, but two years later his guilty verdict was overturned. The Court of Appeals argued that the testimonies of the women who claimed to have been propositioned by him were of no relevance with regard to whether or not he had killed his family. Rather than being released back into society as a free man, David Cam was brought back to court for another trial. Now that they were unable to claim David had killed for love, prosecutors were now claiming that David Cam had been molesting his daughter and that he had murdered his family because his wife had found out about the supposed abuse. The only evidence prosecutors had for this theory was an autopsy report which stated that Jill had suffered damage to her genitalia. During his initial interview with detectives three days after the murders occurred, David Cam had been adamant that if his daughter was sexually assaulted, then it must have been on the night she was killed. However, prosecutors at his trial pointed out that Jill was found fully clothed on the night of her death. They argued that it was ludicrous to suggest her killer had undressed her, carried out a violent sexual assault and then put her clothes back on. They also called to the stand a forensic paediatrician who testified that the injuries to Jill's genitalia had been inflicted up to two days before she was murdered. David's second trial was unique in that by the time it started, 
Another man had already been convicted in relation to the murders. On the night that Kim, Jill and Brad were found shot to death in their garage, officers at the scene found a grey sweater with the word backbone written along the collar. The DNA of an unknown male was also found on the sweater, along with the DNA of an unknown female. Shortly before the commencement of his second trial, David's defence team requested that the DNA sample be run through a system known as CODIS. CODIS is the DNA database of the United States. It was created and is run by the FBI. David's defence team were assured by prosecutors that the unknown DNA had already been run through CODIS and that no matches had been made. This was a falsehood. The DNA found at the murder scene had never been run through CODIS. David's defence team was forced to secure a court order for the samples to be run through the database. They were elated when a match was detected for the male DNA. Charles Bonnet was a career criminal from the nearby city of New Albany. Bonnet had a peculiar interest in women's feet and he had spent the better part of a decade in prison for assaults on women. During these attacks, Bonnet would indulge in his foot fetish and force his female victims to remove their shoes. To law enforcement, Charles Bonnet was known as the shoe bandit, but to his fellow prison inmates, he went by a different moniker, Backbone. When he was interviewed by police, Bonnet admitted to having once owned the sweater in question, but claimed that he had donated it to a clothing bank. Something else would link Charles Bonnet to the crime scene though. His palm print was matched to one found on the Bronco. With the evidence against him now damning, Charles Bonnet confessed to his involvement in the triple murder. He claimed that after selling him a gun, David Cam had then shot his family dead. Bonnet's story was far-fetched, but his testimony was still enough to convince the jury that David Cam had killed his wife and children. For a second time, David Cam was found guilty of carrying out the murders. He was sentenced to life without the possibility of parole, while his co-accused was sentenced to 225 years. Once again though, David's sentence was overturned. In 2009, almost three years after being found guilty of murdering his family for a second time, the Indiana Supreme Court ruled that there was no evidence at all to suggest that David had been molesting his daughter. Remember, the crux of the prosecution argument during the second trial was that David had been sexually abusing Jill and his wife Kim had found out. Despite beating two guilty verdicts, David Cam would stand trial for the triple homicide of his family for a third time. Almost four years later, in the fall of 2009, David's third trial began. He had thus far spent 13 years of his life behind bars. During his first trial, prosecutors had argued that David was a serial adulterer. For his second trial, they had accused him of sexually abusing his daughter. Now, they would argue that David's real motivation all along had been money. Shortly before her death, Kim had taken out a series of life insurance policies. Charles Bonnet was called to testify against David as a star witness. According to Bonnet, he knew David Cam from having once played basketball against him. He stated that roughly one week later, he bumped into David at a gas station and that after inquiring about his criminal past, had asked Bonnet to source him a handgun that was untraceable. Charles Bonnet told the jury that he had done as David asked and after buying a handgun for $75 from a criminal associate, he had then sold it to David for $250. Charles Bonnet stated that he was lured to David Cam's house on the night of the murders under the pretense of supplying a second gun. After handing over the gun, which was supposedly wrapped in his grey sweater, the one officers would later find, Bonnet claimed that Kim pulled up in the Bronco and drove into the garage. Bonnet then claimed that David Cam went inside the garage and that a number of gunshots quickly rang out. Suddenly, David Cam re-emerged and aimed the gun at Bonnet 
but for some reason it did not go off when he tried to fire it. At this point, Bonnet stated that he was consumed by rage and chased David Cam into the garage. He said that he stumbled over a pair of women's shoes while running and that he may have placed them atop the Bronco. Bonnet then claimed that he thought he could hear David Cam rummaging around inside the house and suspected that he might be looking for ammunition. He told jurors that he jumped into his vehicle and fled the scene. However, David's third trial would introduce new DNA evidence that had not been presented before. A forensic scientist testified that he had found Bonnet's DNA on both Kim and Jill Cam. This blew a hole in Bonnet's testimony that he had never come into physical contact with the victims. In a panic, prosecutors now argued that while Bonnet may indeed have been the shooter, David Cam still played an active role in aiding and abetting the murders. However, the crux of the forensic evidence against David was the blood spotter found on his t-shirt, which prosecutors had argued was consistent with him being the shooter. They were essentially throwing out their own evidence. David's defence team were adamant that their client didn't even know Charles Bonnet. With the case against him now completely discredited, a jury found David Cam not guilty of all charges on October 24th, 2013. He was now finally a free man. Today, David Cam is getting on with his life. He works for a non-profit organisation known as Investigating Innocence, which provides help to inmates who are serving time due to weak convictions. He spent 13 years of his life behind bars for a crime he was totally innocent of.